G'day everyone, we are now live. Welcome to uh, another live event tonight. Uh, this one uh, on Whisper. Uh, before I begin, uh, just been uh, a bit of an update. I haven't done uh, an awful lot of videos. I had a lot of time for videos over the last uh, couple of days or the last couple of weeks. I've been away and uh, just been busy at work, but uh, I've got some more coming uh, soon, so I'll uh, get to those. But uh, for tonight, we've got uh, a... Uh, an interesting topic on Whisper that I thought that I'd cover, so might give it a few more minutes. You can see we've got a couple uh, joining in on the uh, on the stream, and uh, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe button to uh, throughout the the video if you enjoy it. <clears throat> Good evening to Paul. First comment there. Making sure that all my stream health is correct, which it looks fine. Okay, so we're talking about Whisper. So many would be familiar with um, this uh, this page, uh, WhisperNet, and uh, there's just uh, some interesting lines. We'll go over what uh, all of uh, this is and what Whisper actually is and how it can be beneficial. So let's go into what Whisper is and what Whisper isn't. So a good place to start would be the WSJT um, 2.0 user guide. So uh, this uh, highlighted bit here, uh, Joe Taylor, K1JT in the, uh, in the user guide says that Whisper stands for Weak Signal Propagation Reporter. Uh, the Whisper protocol was designed for probing potential propagation paths using low power transmissions. Uh, Whisper messages normally carrying the tran uh, Whisper messages normally carry the transmitting station's call sign, grid locator, and transmitter power in dBm, and they can be decoded at signal to noise ratios as low as minus thirty one dB in a twenty five hertz uh, twenty five hundred hertz bandwidth. So, this number um, minus thirty one's actually changed. Uh, there's been a um, well, it used to be minus twenty eight. That's how sensitive Whisper used to be below the noise floor. Um, and uh, since I think version two, uh, it's uh, it, they've got a couple of uh, extra dB out of it, so it's a little bit more sensitive. So those that have Whisper installed uh, with internet access can upload their reception reports to a central database called WhisperNet, which I showed just a minute ago. Uh, has a mapping facility, uh, archives uh, all the spots, and does some other things. So that's a very basic overview of what uh, Whisper actually is. Uh, what Whisper isn't is a uh, contact mode, so like FT4, FT8, uh, JT65, it's not that. So uh, a lot of people uh, say that um, uh, Whisper's not a contact mode, that's in, uh, completely correct. Uh, however, it's still very useful for attempting to make contact. So we'll have a look at how that's uh, possible later on. So, um, so it is though a, a beacon mode. Now, um, what that means is that it can be uh, can be left unattended in receive or transmit or both, um, and uh, then can be received by many different uh, stations, uh, potentially even uh, around the world, depending on what band you're on. So, if we go back to the Whisper uh, Net website, so uh, this can be accessed at whispernet.org. And uh, there's a link in the description to all of the material that, I, uh, that I'll cover here tonight. So if we have a look, um, we can see that this is 30 metres at the moment. Um, and this is the last 10 minutes. So I actually haven't um, refreshed this page. Let's refresh it again. So you can see there, um, here in Australia, we've got quite a few uh, signals going to uh, um, Asia there. A uh, couple from um, the United States to Hawaii and uh, quite a few in Europe. If I actually zoom in here, you can see there's an awful lot in Europe. So what's this basically showing this map for those that haven't seen it before is, is uh, each station on the map here represents a station running uh, Whisper on their uh, computer uh, using in, uh, inside WSJT uh, X. 
And basically, if you click on one of these stations, you'll get a list of stations that it has heard or that it's hearing. So this guy, uh, F50IH, he's hearing all of these stations on 30 meters. Um, he's not uh, being heard by anyone, probably because he's not transmitting. Let's try and find someone else. Here's another one that looks like he's not hearing <laughs> anybody, but he's being heard. So quite interesting. So here's a list of call signs anyway that, uh, that uh, are hearing this station. Uh, now you can also drill down into some more information on Whisper um, by clicking the database uh, icon here. So I've got it just linked up in the top and I've just got some VK data. So if we just refresh that again, I think this is in the last hour. Um, once it refreshes, sometimes it can take a little bit of time. If we have a look at the data quickly um, that's there at the moment, we can see uh, some, uh, some interesting signals. So this one here was uh, not too long ago, probably about uh, or 10 minutes ago, uh, VK6CQ uh, is being heard by KL7L uh, over 13,000 kilometres away. And you can see the signal to noise you mentioned, I, I mentioned minus 31, he's being heard at minus 28 on, uh, on 10 megs and only running one watt. So very, very low power um, on that particular um, transmission. So what's Whisper actually handy for? Well, Whisper's handy for the uh, finding out if propagation is uh, happening on the particular band that you're interested in. So in this case, 30 meters is usually uh, a fairly easy band. It's open um, a lot of the time. Uh, low power can can get you quite a far di uh, quite far distances. Uh, but then it gets very interesting when you start to move into um, bands such as six meters and above where um, we can use Whisper to find um, paths that we would otherwise not find. Um, and having unattended um, transmitters and receivers means that uh, if you've got a spare radio that's sitting not doing anything, um, or if you're um, like me, go to work, uh, busy, you can uh, have it running through the day and uh, potentially pick up on some, uh, some propagation that's happening, which I'll go into uh, how I've managed to have done that in my situation. So going back to this map, let's have a look at another band uh, rather than uh, 30 metres. Let's have a look at 6 metres and we'll just change the time period to the last 24 hours because uh, this will be of interest to our United States and European viewers on this video. Got some uh, questions setting in. G'day uh, Richard, good to have you in Peter. Um, maybe those not hearing it. Ah, yes, very good uh, uh, point uh, Peter. Um, so those that uh, are not uh, hearing anybody uh, might be using transmitter only, um, whisper trans uh, transmitters that don't have receivers such as the whisper light. So uh, very good point that uh, that probably is very true. So uh, here in VK at the moment, we're in the middle of uh, winter. It's uh, rather cold outside, but we do have uh, some sporadic E openings in the middle of winter. So um, whilst they're not as... Uh, um, frequent as summer. Um, at the moment in the northern hemisphere it is summer so they're getting a lot more um, uh, openings. But if we have a look back at this map we can look at the Australian uh, signals. This is over the last day. There's been a few. Um, so um, uh, this station VK5GF he's heard uh, VK4ADC and uh, ZL3PX on six meters. So we can see uh, a couple of stations there. If we go uh, and zoom into Europe. Uh, there's been uh, a few in uh, few in Euro Europe here too, which uh, seem to uh, coincide with their summer over there. They've had quite a, a hot week over the last uh, um, or the last few days. Sorry, um, so um, looks like they're getting some good uh, sporadic e uh, in their summer at the moment. So. Um, you get a visual uh, indication anyway of what um, what's going on on any particular band. Now, getting into how this is handy for those on bands such as six meters and above. What uh, what we've managed to uh, to do is um, get uh, quite a number of stations running uh, Whisper, 
And of course, uh, as I've already shown, it archives the information in a readable format such as this, which allows us to see exactly what the signal to noise ratio is and uh, what the uh, um, uh, power levels are. So that's handy uh, in a few ways. If we go back to uh, Australia's last summer, and I'll use this um, as a bit of an example for, uh, um, once I can find it, I'll use it as a bit of an example. This here was one particular day, it's a little bit small, I'll see if I can zoom up, whoops, that's not what I want. This was one particular day last summer and you can see how many stations I was being heard by at my station here and how many were hearing me. This was quite a very intense uh, six metre opening and we can see uh, lots of stations and uh, one even to E51WL. I'm trying to remember exactly where he was but anyway he's in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And uh, this um, this helps us uh, in uh, visualize anyway how fast uh, we're getting propagation on six meters. So in this case, there was multiple uh, sporadic key hops uh, along this path. Now, if I go along to uh, another photo here, which I have uh, prepared, we can uh, even go even further. This I think was from last summer. <clears throat> Yeah, and uh, on the 3rd of January at about midday Australian time, N3IZN, uh, Chris uh, over here in, I think he's close to San Diego, he was heard by VK5LA, That's, that was over 13,026 kilometres. He was also heard by VK3WE, uh, 12,612 kilometres. Now, how's that handy? Well, it uh, reported, uh, a few amateurs picked up on this and realised that uh, there was uh, activity happening across the Pacific to the United States. And uh, they reported it on a, uh, a, a spot of a program called VK Logger. Uh, not only that, it was also, I think, uploaded to uh, DX Maps and uh, a few other places. And uh, some stations caught onto this and they managed to have JT65 contacts uh, across the same path. Now, uh, the best way that we've been using Whisper is, an, is as an early warning system. So it tells us when the band is just about to open. Now, uh, there's, there's probably plenty of ways that you could do that. You could use, um, uh, but it, it relies on uh, having two stations at either end uh, to, uh, to find out if the band's open because obviously you can call CQ all day. doesn't matter how you do it, whether it's on digital mode, CW, or voice, if there's nobody at the other end, you're not gonna know if the band's open. So this is sort of an automated way of finding out if the band's open, and then once it's open, being able to make a contact from that. Now, another thing to uh, cover uh, with that is that these paths are very rare. So it, as I mentioned, having uh, stations that are at each end running uh, a lot of the time, makes it very easy to find out when the band's actually open. Now, um, uh, here in uh, VK, uh, I'm actually quite surprised that we've got so many stations uh, online uh, running at the moment uh, in the middle of winter because uh, weather's not real good, there's not too many signals that are floating around, but we do have uh, quite a few stations. At the moment, uh, my station uh, is set up. Uh, this is, I'm um, just remoted into my PC uh, next to my uh, radio. It's actually transmitting at the moment. And this is beaming roughly in the direction towards uh, the United States. So I've got this running uh, pretty much 24 seven. Uh, I did erase the, uh, the log out of here, so I haven't uh, received any stations recently, but um, I am running this um, towards, uh, towards the United States in the hope that uh, we, uh, we get through on their summer. So, <clears throat> just had a quick um, question here. Paul, uh, can you claim the contact as a QSL? No, you can't um, due to the fact that they're one way. So what happens is, is when a, um, 
if I can bring up a an example. Let's use this as an example. This is what would be normally received. Uh, actually, no, that's probably not a very good example. Uh, I don't have anything offhand. Uh, but basically, no, because it's a one-way uh, thing, so you're receiving basically the person's call sign, you're receiving their signal-to-noise ratio, you're receiving their grid square. Um, it's not a two-way contact uh, as such uh, because you're not confirming it. Uh, you're not exchanging grids, so uh, technically it's uh, not a contact, which is a uh, a point of contention with a lot of people why they don't use Whisper because they think that it's uh, a contact mode when, when, as I explained before, it's not. It's a, it's a beacon mode to enable those um, who wish to make contacts to know if the band's open. Um, I think I've lost my train of thought. So anyway, that's what um, that's what uh, I've been using Whisper for uh, with six meters uh, is uh, trying to uh, to get uh, long distance uh, contacts, which would uh, otherwise go unnoticed um, due to having no stations at either end. So uh, yeah, oh that's right. As I said, so we've got quite a few stations in uh, in VK, and uh, my um, mine is running uh, at the moment so we can see uh, I've just got uh, I've just put in a transmit frequency uh, on the waterfall sitting here at 1520 Hertz this is the frequency that I transmit on um, my transmit percentage is only set to 10% of the time uh, so it's not transmitting all the time and I actually am running 50 watts because on six meters um, it uh, it uh, it's good to run a, a little bit of power um, when there's uh, when conditions are marginal, uh, usually in summer I'll back this off to only five watts because uh, signals are so strong. Now, one uh, particular um, benefit of uh, using this is the ability to detect um, signals on two meters. So we've even used Whisper on two meters as well. Now, there's a program you can probably see just running off to the right here called Whisper View. Now, WhisperView was developed by a VK4 ADC. Now, it doesn't show an awful lot uh, in this window, so I'll actually go to his uh, website. So VK4 ADC, and you can see here that uh, it actually populates uh, all the data that you get from WhisperNet in a bit of a readable format, and you can do some sorting and uh, sort by kilometres and uh, time and signal to noise and all sorts of things. In addition to this, it also can email you uh, information related to um, whatever you uh, you put in these uh, particular fields that you want to filter down to. So uh, what happened was uh, last summer at the start of, um, I think it was about the start of um, January, uh, January the 5th, uh, we had quite a strong six meter opening and uh, I wasn't monitoring the radio at the time, I was, uh, I was at home uh, it was on a weekend, but uh, I, I wasn't really paying attention to what was going on. But I did have Whisper uh, running uh, on my six meter station. Anyhow, I uh, received a uh, an email notification through my uh, phone, which said that uh, I'd been received on uh, six meters at a rather uh, strong signal strength uh, at a short distance. So those that are familiar with sporadic E, um, when a uh, sporadic E cloud sits uh, up in the E layer, uh, when a uh, when, uh, signal um, hits the E-cloud and bounces off at a, at a sharp angle, uh, then it's a reduced uh, a distance between those two stations. If that's a really strong signal, then it means that there might be potential for the MUF or the maximum usable frequency of the uh, E-cloud to extend two meter signals even further. So I got a notification to say that uh, my um, a six meter station was being received in uh, VK1, which is fairly short to a distance away. I think it's only about 700 kilometers or so away from my uh, my location. So straight away, I thought, oh well, I'll try uh, I'll try two meters. And uh, once again, I got on the the VK Logger or VK Spotter uh, program and uh, sent out a a couple of things to say that I was uh, I was getting these signals. And this comeback, uh, this video is. Um, on my YouTube channel, 
and uh, straight away I was able to make contact with uh, some VK4. Roger, Roger, 5 9, Adrian. Roger, QSL 59 to 57, 57, Roger. Roger, Roger, thank you, 7 3. So you can see that 6 metres, I would have missed that otherwise, uh, sorry, Whisper, I would have missed that contact otherwise, uh, and many more like it. If I hadn't had Whisper running in the background, I would have never have known that there was uh, an opening happening. And it meant that uh, uh, this. Um, also extended to VK3 and some of the other VK4s were able to make contacts there too. So it was very handy. So going more into detail uh, about that, I wrote a couple of articles on my uh, website uh, a few years ago. Uh, this particular one was again another uh, uh, VK4 uh, contact on Whisper. Sorry, I said contact, VK4 report uh, on Whisper. I uh, left it running on two meters uh, one day and uh, I uh, come back uh, after I'd been away. And uh, this is the, the signal strengths that I re reported on uh, two meters. And this is quite a, a, a fair distance away, uh, over 1800 kilometers to VK4CZ. And uh, you can see here that at the exact times or around about these time, the time of these contacts, you can see here that there was quite a strong six meter signal between VK2 EFM and VK2 KRR. And this signal, uh, this distance was only 440 kilometers or 241 miles, I think. No, that's the, that might be, uh, no, sorry, that's the bearing. Yeah, 440 kilometers. So what that was saying is uh, VK2 KRR is sort of around about uh, uh, here somewhere, I think. And uh, the station that uh, he heard was, uh, I think, in Sydney. So about halfway along the path almost between me and uh, VK4. So uh, we were able to use this data to, to then figure out that there may have been an opening on two metres. And here's some more um, data which uh, sort of correlates that. There's a couple of signals. They're not majorly too strong, but uh, this one in particular is. And then I had a, also another recurring one. Um, so uh, this at uh, this time, uh, an amateur was hearing uh, Tamworth Airport uh, locally here, which was over 1,370 kilometres away. And uh, I had a look, and sure enough, six metres was showing very strong signals at very short distances. And uh, I did plot these on a map. And uh, you can see here that the approximate midpoint of this path was just south Southeast of Canberra, and uh, coincidentally, the halfway point between, uh, well, it's a bit cut off, but between Hobart and Tamworth was around about just south of Canberra, so that exact same cloud. So you can see how Whisper has made it very easy for um, us to capture this data to then figure out when signals are going to um, increase uh, in frequency, allow propagation on two metres. Uh, Whisper is also handy for those that are testing out antennas. So uh, if you have a new antenna, you want to know how it performs. Um, there's a lot that use Whisper for that. And uh, those that use uh, QRP and low power uh, to see how far uh, a distance they can get on any particular band. But this is what I've been using Whisper for anyway over the past uh, few uh, few years. Um, there's uh, quite a few of us um, who, uh, who are members of, say, the, uh, the, face, uh, the Whisper 2 meter, 6 meter Facebook pages. I'll put a link in the description to those as well. And uh, we've uh, managed to uh, make quite a few contacts on, uh, on 6 and 2 meters that would otherwise uh, go unnoticed. So generally my rule of thumb is uh, when um, uh, signals are starting to get to probably about minus 10 dB or so, uh, CW starts to become possible. Um, those that have a good ear can uh, can maybe go a little bit lower than that. Uh, when uh, when you're talking about voice, uh, you're sort of looking at maybe plus five, plus ten dB above the noise uh, on the uh, on the reports for uh, for voice. So generally, what I do is when those sort of signals start to creep up to those sort of levels, I'll stop running whisper and then I'll switch to voice and try and make some voice contacts, and that's worked very well. So we've got a couple of uh, 
questions here. Uh, interest to see how aurora scatter and meteor showers can enhance the propagation. Interesting uh, question uh, there, Paul. So, um, aurora. Uh, so one thing that I did neglect to mention is that uh, Whisper transmits a uh, in a two minute uh, window, and now over that two minute window, it's allowed to drift uh, a maximum of four hertz uh, in frequency. So what uh, might happen with uh, aurora scatter is um, because, uh, well, because of the aurora, the, the signal scattered, so it can be wider than the bandwidth of that, that four hertz that it's got to be stable at. Um, so generally for, yeah, for aurora, um, whisper's not a very good mode to, to use. Um, um, you'd be better off uh, maybe using one of the faster uh, modes possibly. Um, but um, uh, one thing to note is that Whisper has been used for EME before and has been uh, has been decoded off the moon, which is uh, which is rather interesting. So uh, it it has been it has been done for that. Um, uh, meteor showers. Meteor showers are, are way too quick. So as I mentioned, the the, the two minute cycle. Generally, uh, WSJT uh, the WSJT program has to decode uh, I think at least a minute or a minute and a half I think the first minute is timing so uh, a minute and a half or so before it'll get a decode uh, you can lose a little bit there um, so generally with uh, six meters you'll notice sometimes uh, signals will will fluctuate up and down and uh, you might not get a decode it might be there one second and disappear the next um, so you might get oh, well you might get a signal for say 30 seconds and then it disappears and it doesn't decode because you haven't uh, received the full two minute. And uh, the reason for the two minutes is, is there's a lot of information that's packed into such a small bandwidth um, that, uh, that takes time to transfer, so or takes time to transmit to be decoded at the other end. Um, but uh, yeah, more information on how Whisper actually works is available on, um, on uh, the, uh, the WSJT manual. Um, but... Um, Certainly for six meters, it's, uh, it's been a, a valuable uh, tool to use. I'll try and find uh, if I can find the, uh, the Whisper um, EME um, contact. Uh, it was done in the early days by VK7MO and K1JT actually as a test. Um, I didn't have this prepared, but it's an interesting uh, thing to look at anyway. Here it is. Uh, bear with me a sec as I uh, bring it up on the stream. Here it is. So this is one of the very early versions of Whisper. Now you'll notice <coughs> these, uh, I think these transmissions were continuous at 100%. Um, from um, from VK7MO and now received by VK uh, by K1JT Joe Taylor. One thing you'll notice here is the drift is uh, is a little bit in frequency, but you'll notice the timing. So this proves that it was off the moon uh, due to the delay, the timing delay, uh, two point nine to three seconds. So uh, yeah, quite uh, quite strong signals actually off the moon. So it does work via EME. Um, but uh, that's uh, that's much different to uh, to the other um, uh, propagation techniques that you mentioned about uh, aurora scatter and uh, and meteor showers. Uh, one interesting thing that I have noted with uh, listening to whisper is uh, you can actually hear meteor pings. You'll hear very very strong uh, signals for a split second uh, in the speaker of the radio before it uh, before it disappears. And um, uh, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's not really useful for such a quick mode. Uh, good day to Russ as well, VK three ART. Good to have you uh, in there. So um, yeah, if there's, uh, I'll pause now for uh, for any questions to try and uh, to try and answer those. Uh, so just pop them into the uh, into the chat. But uh, yeah, it's uh, definitely a, a worthwhile thing to try and um, look at. Uh, um, Putting uh, if you've got a spare radio for your own uh, station to uh, to set up on Whisper, uh, particularly uh, those uh, who uh, are currently having uh, um, who have summer. So uh, at the moment, northern 
uh, hemisphere uh, in the United States and uh, the UK. Um, for up for six meters, uh, it's very uh, very likely that you'll get a lot of sporadic air activity. Uh, opposite for here in Australia, our summers in uh, December, uh, January. So uh, for those operating it on those bands, it would uh, be handy to uh, to have it running then. Um, so very quickly, um, this is uh, one of the many uh, different um, interfaces that I have for running uh, my digital modes. I have a, uh, a, an FT9091 at home which just has a USB that goes straight into the computer. But for those that maybe have uh, an older radio, uh, I just use the, uh, the Signalink um, USB um, box and uh, this basically just allows me to set levels and uh, interface to, uh, to the radio that I want. This one actually uh, interfaces to my FT817 so I can, uh, I can use this uh, with my, uh, my 817 on, uh, on Whisper. So I haven't seen any other uh, uh, questions uh, come in just yet. Hopefully uh, that's made sense. Bit of a rushed uh, live stream tonight. I didn't really want it going for too long and I wanted to cover uh, as many uh, bits and pieces that I, uh, that I could. Uh, I was aiming for about half an hour, so up to 21 minutes or so. Um, maybe uh, what we might do is I might just show a couple of uh, whisper transmitters that you can purchase. Um, there's uh, there's quite a few uh, on the uh, available. Um, uh, one particular one is called the uh, the Whisper Light, and another one is the uh, the QRP Labs uh, Ultimate Kit. So this is the the Ultimate Kit that you can purchase. Uh, the ultimate, uh, the ultimate 3S. Uh, it uh, it does uh, quite a few different modes, but one of them is the whisper mode. Uh, as mentioned before, this is only a transmit uh, kit, and uh, it can operate on many different HF bands, and I believe it can also operate on six meters and two meters. But there's uh, there's lots of information on the uh, the QRP Labs website. The other more uh, popular whisper transmitter is the uh, Whisper Light, so this is a, a, a really a, a plug and play solution uh, for those that want to uh, to run a, a Whisper uh, transmitter. There's some information on that uh, on that website on uh, on using it, and you can see the the spots there of this particular user on uh, on thirty meters. Um, I've also used in the past uh, Raspberry Pi connected to a radio, um, so that way you don't have to have a computer running all the time. Uh, Raspberry Pis use very little uh, power, and it's very easy to install uh, WSJTX on these and have them interface to, to run as both a transmitter and receiver. So one of the benefits um, of having um, uh, a transmit and receive uh, functionality as rather than just transmit is the fact that uh, it's a it's a sort of a two-way beacon then uh, you can be heard and also be heard by uh, sorry you can also be heard and also hear other stations so um, a couple of settings maybe that I'll run through here in WSJTX I've still got an old ver older version but um, it should still apply in uh, the newer versions there's an upload st uh, spots button Make sure that that's ticked because that will actually upload all of the uh, messages that you decode uh, yourself to uh, the internet, to that uh, whispernet.org. And uh, preferred type one messages uh, generally uh, have this one uh, have this one uh, ticked. There's some uh, information there, um, but I won't go into it. It's into a bit too much detail for what we want to go into today. And uh, just setting the uh, the power level. <coughs> Another thing uh, that's also said is the percentage. So this only uh, transmits uh, at ten percent. So uh, transmitting a hundred percent would be every two minute uh, block, or uh, uh, every two minutes uh, it uh, would uh, continually transmit. Uh, setting it to fifty percent would be every four minutes, and so forth. Um, now there is one thing with this: the 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 uh, program does sometimes randomly not uh, transmit uh, exactly at the same time. This is to avoid collisions with, uh, with other stations to better the chances of being heard by someone. 
and you can see a waterfall unfortunately there's no stations around but uh, generally the you'll see a, a waterfall uh, or a signal in the waterfall uh, pop up if there was any stations uh, to be decoded and whispers just able to be accessed from the mode uh, drop down box of WSJTX. So that's really uh, all that I was uh, going to cover in this um, on this topic. Um, there's uh, there's a lot of information out there uh, on Whisper and uh, how it actually works, how to get it uh, to work with um, uh, the way you want it. But uh, I thought it would be really important to share exactly uh, what I've used it for and the benefits of using it for that purpose. Um, one thing that uh, that uh, does happen on occasion is um, you'll get the odd uh, spot which is incorrect, um, probably due to the fact that it's been decoded uh, incorrectly or there's been a bit of corruption on the uh, on the uh, the decoding side of things. And uh, generally, you might have a station maybe out in the middle of uh, the ocean, or uh, or, you might, or a bit of a strange call sign. Um, so generally, that's uh, that's not too much to be uh, to be worried about. It uh, doesn't happen very often. I just uh, found something very interesting here. We might um, just bring that up. This is on ten meters, and uh, there's been an awful lot more ten meter sporadic E activity. Uh, over in the uh, the United States over the past 24 hours, and you can see all these uh, all these signals between all these stations. And uh, there's been one here in Australia, one lonely one uh, between VK3KCX and JG1EIQ in Japan. So you can still see that there is uh, a little bit of uh, a little bit of activity happening on the bands. Uh, so. Once again, a good way of finding out exactly what's happening, what propagation is doing by using this uh, this beacon mode, and then being able to then use that data, um, see exactly where the bands open, and then move over to make, try and make a contact with somebody. A question from Peter: How accurate does timing need to be? Um, so generally, timing needs to be uh, as accurate as possible. So um, on um, my PC on sorry on each PC uh, you need to run some sort of time uh, program so you can see I run a, a program called uh, I think this is called net time if you do a search for net time uh, short for network time yeah that's right this uh, automatically synchronizes every 10 minutes uh, with um, with my clock on my computer and then what that'll do is ensure that my uh, my clock is never out um, if you don't have access to internet and you can't do this all the time, uh, generally uh, the tolerance of the uh, of the the timing is probably about three to four seconds. Any more than three and a half to four seconds, and it starts to to not uh, decode correctly. So um, yeah, the timing needs to be uh, to be fairly critical, but um, you can get away with uh, with a couple of seconds, as was evident with the EME parts. Uh, they were uh, three seconds out, and they were still able to be decoded. So, um, yeah, making sure that your uh, uh, your clock is uh, is is uh, uh, time is correct is uh, essential. Um, what else can we uh, can we cover? Uh, we've got uh, a little bit of time left until uh, I reach uh, my my half an hour. Um, yeah, just um, yeah. If you've got a, a very very handy for those that have a spare radio, uh, setting it up. Um, oh, that's that's one thing that I did forget to cover. I was talking about two meters, wasn't I? <clears throat> so uh, another thing, uh, not just with sporadic E, but uh, during summer in particular, is we get tropospheric path uh, ducting. Uh, now I had, uh, I uh, sorry, I've got a remote station which uh, operates uh, on three bands at the moment. One of those is two metres. And I uh, happen to predict that, uh, to use the, the Hepburn charts, if you haven't seen the Hepburn, chart, Hepburn charts, basically they uh, show a, 
uh, a prediction of what uh, tropospheric ducting may happen due to weather conditions. And there was a good chance that there was a, a path on uh, two, or there was a path across uh, the Great Australian Bight uh, between my location and VK6. So uh, I managed to get in contact with uh, a VK6 amateur, VK6 JR Wayne, and uh, said to him, "Look, uh, conditions look good, and um, we we might be able to um, to see if we can make a contact if signals uh, come up strong enough." So uh, what happened was, is in the uh, in the early uh, or early-ish hours of the morning, uh, this happened. Uh, so you can see my station here, and uh, bearing in mind again that this is on uh, two meters. My station was uh, located uh, just outside of Hobart, and it uh, was heard by VK6JR uh, just uh, just on the the almost furthest point of southern uh, southwestern uh, Perth, a uh, southwestern Perth, southwestern dub, southwest of Western Australia, <laughs> and um, you can uh, you can see the path is across land here. And uh, my paths across uh, quite a bit of mountainous terrain as well, but uh, mostly water. Now, this is a good summary of uh, the, the signals that re were received. The first signal was at minus 22. Once again, I received an email to notify me of this. Um, sorry, apologies. First signal was minus 29. Next signal was minus 30, and then it did come up to minus 22. And this is over a path of 2,948 kilometres, so it's a very long distance, and this was only running uh, 50 watts at the time. Um, unfortunately, by the time, um, uh, due to the time difference between uh, my location and uh, Wayne's, uh, it was, I think it was about 8 a.m. in the morning uh, this time. Yeah, I think it was around about 7 to 8 a.m. in the morning, and uh, over here in Perth, it was about 5 a.m., so uh, it was... a a little bit early for Wayne to be up and about. Um, but uh, by the time that uh, I did make contact with him to let him know that uh, signals had, uh, had come up um, and trying to attempt a contact on JT65 uh, or, um, or FT8 maybe even, um, it, uh, it had faded away. But the proof was that there was uh, a path there uh, that would otherwise have not been discovered. And uh, maybe uh, the next time that this happens, uh, signals might be strong enough to make a contact. In this particular case, uh, I believe that this may have been a, uh, a record uh, contact for, uh, for VK, so um, uh, for two metres. So um, uh, it, uh, it would have been good, but anyway, it didn't happen. So uh, once again, um, running Whisper was, uh, was a good way to, to find out if, um, if there was a path there. Another question, would you get better decodes if you started three seconds earlier if doing EME whisper? Uh, if you offset your um, computer by three seconds, um, as I said, the tolerances with the timing is um, not that critical up to the, the time that it takes uh, for the delay with EME. So I think what's the delay with EME? Two, two and a half seconds. Uh, from here to the moon and back. So um, generally, no, there's, there's no real benefit of starting your clock early uh, because I think that you'll be decoded. It's, uh, I think if, uh, if uh, both, both ends of the EME contact uh, were um, correct with their timing, then obviously the only timing delay is two and a half seconds or up to th three seconds due to the, the delay uh, from here to the moon and back. So... Um, not really any benefit of starting it a little bit earlier. Uh, Feel VK6 ADF, yes. Uh, yeah, as mentioned before, so Whisper's really good of comparing uh, antennas, so um, you, can, uh, you can do transmissions uh, from your uh, station to um, on one antenna, uh, see what the signal strength is like, change it to the other antenna, and then you get sort of a, a visual representation in uh, signal-to-noise um, of what the other end's receiving you at or how many people are receiving you. Um, so, for instance, all of my stations on six metres that have decoded me have been off a Yagi, a six-element Yagi that I run. If I switch that to a vertical antenna, there's no way that I'm going to be received by as many stations uh, due to the gain of the antenna and the, the fact that it's directional. So um, that's a, a very good point. 
Uh, minimum signal to noise ratio you need to get whisper for SSB to work. Uh, so I, I gather you're talking about switching from whisper to make a contact on a single sideband on voice. So um, generally, uh, it's usually probably, uh, it's definitely in the plus range, so above the noise, so maybe plus five to plus 10. When you start to get about plus 10, that's when it starts to become reliable. Uh, plus five, maybe if you had a really good ear and you could hear what the other person was saying and you knew what their call sign was. But uh, generally, yeah, uh, about about plus 10 is, is a good, good uh, signal uh, to be able to hear. So uh, for instance, that uh, contact to VK6 on two meters would not be possible uh, on voice because it's just way too, just far too uh, below the noise floor to be able to be possible. And even for CW, it would have to get up to about minus 15 uh, for someone with a really good ear and uh, really good uh, on the on uh, CW to be able to copy um, and exchange call signs. So um, one uh, thing to note is uh, it's uh, very possible to continually watch the signals and see if they go up and down and um, obviously on six meters that happens a lot where uh, stations will be um, really weak and then all of a sudden really strong uh, on hf not so much probably it might be you know fluctuate up and down during the day depending on uh, what band you're on so there's lots of uh, different um, um, variables there as well Okay, well, uh, we'll wait for a couple more questions, and if there's none, then uh, we might uh, might this end this stream early. But that's just a quick overview, anyway, of um, using Whisper for uh, weak signal propagation paths. Um, definitely, uh, if you're watching this later on on replay, put uh, some information in the comments if you've used Whisper um, or any other modes, or um, how you've uh, managed to uh, to use Whisper to your advantage. Um, Difference in dB between Whisper and FT8. Okay, so well, let's have a quick look. We'll go back to uh, there's, a, there's a, a neat little comparison tool, uh, comparison table. Sorry, um, on uh, on the WSJTX website. <clears throat> Bear with me a second. All of this is uh, trying to remember where my where these things are, and sometimes it's not easy to remember where they all are. But uh, pop some more questions in the meantime, uh, if you can think of some, and I'll uh, attempt to answer them. Uh, getting closer. Here we go. Uh, Here we go. So this is um, just gives a comparison. Uh, but uh, to answer that question specifically, we want to look at the signal to noise uh, threshold in dB. So we spoke of uh, how long the transmit duration is. I, I said um, uh, it goes for two minutes. It's actually just under two minutes. Uh, there's a couple of seconds there where it, uh, it's not transmitting. So you can see that uh, in that 110 seconds, uh, we can transmit um, enough information to be able to be decoded at minus 31. Now, in comparison to FT8, FT8 has 10 dB worse um, sensitivity, uh, but of course FT8 is really, really fast. It's only 12.6 transmit uh, duration. So in, uh, I'll give a bit of an example. Uh, this particular station that I showed before, um, if I can zoom up, E51WL. He was coincidentally on um, the uh, the VK, uh, what was uh, known as the VK logger. Uh, it's now been uh, now um, VK spotter is the uh, equivalent replacement. He uh, happened to be on there, and I asked. Uh, I saw that he was decoding me at a signal strength that was more than minus 21. I think it was about minus 18, minus 17, minus 18. And I was decoding him slightly higher in signal, was, uh, I think it was minus 15. I said, do you want to try FT8? 
and we went to FT8 and we made a contact within uh, two minutes of uh, going to FT8. So we used Whisper first of all to make sure that there was a path there, that the signal strengths were strong enough for a, uh, a contact on FT8, went over to FT8 and it was successful. We then ended up uh, going on to, I think, make a contact using uh, QRA, uh, sorry, JT65. Uh, another example was uh, a station in Fiji. Um, we uh, were running Whisper and we had quite strong signals. Uh, we went to um, FT8. FT8 um, come up really strong as well. So I said, well, let's try voice. And we actually managed to have a voice contact as well. So uh, quite exciting. But that was all started basically from running Whisper unattended. I got notified that there were, the, the band was open. Um, I, I wasn't able to be near the radio at the time uh, that the openings happened. But then once I knew that the openings were happening, I was able to then get to the radio and then operate. Couple more uh, questions. Uh, g'day, Scott, who's in on the uh, in on the stream now. So I think I might end it there. Um, there's uh, much more information that can be read up on uh, on Whisper, but it sort of um, is uh, uh, over the top of what I wanted to discuss tonight. Uh, but uh, any more questions, just leave them in the comments later, and uh, I can uh, attempt to answer them, or others can attempt to answer them, of course. And uh, yeah, just uh, run uh, run Whisper uh, when you can and uh, just see how it works for you. But uh, that's a bit of a brief overview of how it's worked for me on um, six metres and above. So thanks for watching.